everybody. Welcome to Girl That'll Preach. I'm Odessa Holden, and in this podcast, I invite my friends to share the passions that are on their hearts. And I guarantee in the next couple of minutes, you are going to say, Girl That'll Preach. Because today, I am really excited to have a chance to kind of chat and share with you a conversation with my friend, Holly Pence. And I've invited her to talk about a topic that is very close to her heart, and that is the importance of the local church. And this topic is so important to Holly that she even wrote a book about it called Small Church, Big Harvest. And later on, we're going to tell you where you can get that book. But first, I want to tell you about my friend. So Holly has worn many hats over her years of ministry. She'll tell you that you know she has a bachelor's degree in education. Um, as a small church pastor's wife, she's been a Sunday school teacher, a play director, a secretary, a counselor. She's done just about everything. She's even swept the hallways and cleaned the bathrooms. But Holly has been married to her husband, Jim, Pastor Jim Pence, for over 48 years. That's a long time. They have two daughters and four grandchildren. And together, they pastor New Covenant Assembly of God in the small community of Montgomery, PA. And as I said, recently, Holly put together a book designed to encourage those who are serving and pastoring in local rural churches who just kind of need to be reminded, you know what, what you do really does matter. And it was actually through getting to through this book that I got to know Holly because during COVID, I got to help her through the publishing process and just working with you and just reading your heart come through the words of this book made me think when I wanted to talk about this topic, I got to contact, contact, contact Holly because she is the perfect person to talk about this important topic of the local church. So, hey, Holly, welcome to Girl That'll Preach. Hi, Odessa. Thank you so much for having me. And I do have to say, I probably would have never published my book without your help. So thank you so much. Well, it was just, I'm so glad that we just got to do the little tiny part of the tech work. You did all the hard work of writing and compiling, and now it can be a blessing to people. So I'm thankful to be a part of it. Thank you. But what, beyond just writing a book about it, why do you believe that the local church is such an essential part in the life of a believer? Well, you know, when we pioneered, when we started our church, I remember reading a book by Gene Getz, and it was called One Another. And he talked about how uh, all those one another verses, love one another, submit one to another, serve one another, um, all those. And then more recently, there's been a book out by Dr. Stuart Scott that's called 31 Ways. And he says there's at least 31 one another verses in the scripture. And, And if you think about it, when we try to do one another things, we can't do them alone. One another automatically implies more than one person. And so we need a place where we can come together and do those one another things in the name of the Lord because he tells us to, and the local church is that. So that's why it's so important. We can't carry out the scripture without the local church. I've never heard that before, but that is so good. I well, really it just makes that. sense, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. And when you really stop and think about it, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> so personally, how, how, how long have you been involved in the local church? And how has that affected you and your family? Well, we uh, of course, we were in a church before we went to Bible college. And then we felt to pioneer a local church in our own hometown. So we went back there and we've been there almost, uh, almost, it'll soon be 40 years. So it's um, been an amazing experience. Uh, We had a head start by going to our hometown. We knew who the movers and the shakers were, Mm -hmm. and we knew who to contact for this or that, that we needed. And it's been a blessing to see people we knew even in high school come to the Lord and come to our church. It's just been um, an awesome, amazing, fulfilling experience. Has it had its down times? Of course, mm-hmm. everything does, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. 
Well, I did not realize that you guys planted the church you were at now. Yep. Yep. And we got never been anywhere else. Your church a couple of times. You got to do a service there. Yes. And we were just there. The man tours. (laughs) Yeah. So I just, I didn't realize that was like all from the very beginning. Yep. So were you one of those pastors um, who always had your kids involved in church or was that kind of an optional (laughs) thing for them? Oh, we always had them involved just because it's what our family was doing that moment. So they were part of it too. Uh, And I think that was good for them. Uh, You know, they learned how to serve. I think the scripture tells us whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And so we taught them, you know, you're handing out bulletins, you're sweeping the floor, whatever. Um, Just do it with all your might as unto the Lord and he'll bless you for it. And I think they found that to be true. Uh, Recently, our our grandchildren who who live just a couple houses from us, one of them got a job in the blueberry patch for the summer. And we went to pick her up one day and the uh, adult supervisor said, your granddaughter is a wonderful worker. And I thought, I think that happened at home. You know, mom and dad taught them. But I also think that happened in the local church because she's also uh, on the tech team there. You know, these younger people know more about tech than the older people. And uh, she's in the tech booth very many weeks. And she also um, has been helping with youth ministry. So she learned to serve as well in the church. I think it's a good thing for us. Yeah. And one of the chapters that I really enjoyed in your book was you had an entire chapter devoted to kids ministry within the local church. Yeah. And you talked about the importance of children being part of the local church and not just seeing it like, oh, well, they come with their parents and we have to send them off for babysitting or entertainment. Right. feeling like they were a valued part of the community. Could you yes. share a little bit with that about that with us? Sure, sure. Um, I, of, of course, I believe that the primary teaching about Jesus and, the, and God should come in the home. And the church should supplement that. But we're all aware that it doesn't always happen in the home. And we all know people who um, are part of the church today because neighbors picked them up when they were kids, or uh, a a family member from far away came and told them about the Lord and took them to church. So I believe the church should be a supplement to the families who are teaching about the Lord, but also uh, sometimes it's the only source of, of information about the Lord for children. So when the kids come in, I think we should make them feel like valued members of the congregation. So many people use the term that they're the church of the future. No, they are the church right now. And if there's anything I am kind of anti, it's bringing kids in just to babysit them. I feel like if we have time with children, we better make good use of that time. We may never see them again. They may never come back. Uh, So each week, each opportunity, each small group, whatever, they should be, first of all, receiving valuable instruction about the word of God. But then what's more important is how to apply that to real life situations. I know, and I bet you know, tons of people that know lots of scriptures and lots of Bible stories, but they never learned how to apply it to real life. And to me, that's so, so important. The way we do that and to also make them feel valued is we can use them in various areas of service that we have kids at the at the door greeting people on Sunday mornings. We have kids doing plays like most churches do, but they through those plays, they learn scriptures, they learn dance moves, they learn all kinds of songs that stay with them forever and ever. My kids, my adult kids still sing the songs they learned from, you know, way, way back. Um, they work then, like I said, Kylie's in the tech booth. Uh, and And then we need to, also reward them. I I believe we should mention it from the pulpit. So thankful to have Brody in the booth this week. He's really helping us out. So thankful that the kids are are doing this or that. Help it to be um, noticed by the whole congregation. Mm -hmm. And even maybe monetarily noticed. We had a 
funeral recently where a young man, we asked a young man who works in our tech booth, could you come to that funeral and run the PowerPoint for a slideshow the family wants to show about the person who died? And he said, sure. And he never expected any financial remuneration, but Jim made sure that he got a little cash for doing that. It's recognizing that you have valued gifts no matter how old you are. And um, then they just end up naturally growing into doing it as adults. Yeah. That is one of my big soap box issues. It's something that you touched on because we were raised in the church and, you know, we're, we're getting up there. I'm going to be 50 in a couple of years. And so we were raised before there was so much organized children's church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I sat in church. I sat in Wednesday night services. We had kids church on Wednesday nights. But Jamie and I were talking a couple of days ago about all of the major spiritual events in my life happened on a Sunday night. I was saved on a Sunday night. I was baptized in water on a Sunday night, filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I was called to ministry at seven years old on a Sunday night. And that's kids, very cool. Kids need to be in church. They yes. need to be participating in church. And yes, you know, God doesn't wait until necessarily you're, you know, ready to graduate from high school to call you. I know so many people who've been called when they were kids and yes, being in the church, they can experience the power of the Holy spirit. God right. doesn't wait, have an age limit on when kids can start you know, experiencing him and growing in him and he starts working in their lives, kids are important to the church. Well, if you think about it, David was a young boy when he was called. Josiah was a young boy king. I mean, God never says you have to be this certain age in order to, to you know, be part of his family. Exactly. So in your book, I took it to understand that you guys kind of have a balance between time for the kids to be kids and time for the kids to be with the adults. Yes. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, well, COVID brought about the idea that, you know, first of all, we had to go online to give even our Sunday school classes to children, which we did for a while. And when we came back, we did not have Sunday school before church anymore. We had Sunday school during church. I don't know how I feel about that to this day, but that's the way it is. The so, lot of with COVID that we're still just like, <laughs> You know, exactly, sure. exactly. And, and the reason I don't know how I feel about that is we lose out on adult Sunday school, which I think is super valuable because people can discuss. They really can discuss. In church, we sit and listen and hopefully we take it in and it challenges us. But I, I miss adult Sunday school where we actually discuss. But a lot of churches do that through small groups and other things. Anyway, for the children, we came up with this thought that uh, through kindergarten through fifth grade, they would go to that Sunday school class during church each week of the month. Mm -hmm. But for, I'm sorry, kindergarten through third grade, but for our fourth and fifth graders, they should be learning to be in church. So we kind of said, let's have a little graduation ceremony when they leave third grade. We give them a uh, journal. You can buy them online. There's lots of different kinds, but their sermon uh, note journals. So everybody gets one. Then when, um, one, one week a month when they're in fourth and fifth grade, they are not in Sunday school. They come to church with their sermon journal, which asks them questions about what they're hearing. And they take notes. They maybe draw pictures, whatever, that goes with the sermon. And, and they add to that every week until they fill their journal. And then by sixth grade, they're, they're in church every Sunday. That's a great so, idea. It's kind of like an intermediate thing. I like it is. That. It's a transition time because just to say, well, now you don't get to come to Sunday school, bang, you know, is a little bit much. But uh, if they learn to be in church on one Sunday a month, then it's not such a big, you know, change for them. I like that idea. And I think it encourages us to take notes. We should be taking notes in sermons too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, next question, how yeah. can being involved in a local community of believers help you grow in your relationship with God? So many people say, well, I don't, I don't need to go to church. I have my own personal relationship. Yeah. But how can being with a local community help your personal relationship? 
Well, first of all, when people say, I don't need the, the local church, I'm going to grant them maybe they believe that. But I'm going to start by saying, well, then we need you. Hmm. You know, the scripture like tells that. us, yeah, the scripture tells us that if you're a Christian, then you have gifts and you have things that the body needs. I believe it's in Corinthians, it talks about how can the foot say, I don't need the hand and how can the eye say, I don't need the ear. So maybe you don't need us, but we certainly need you if you're a Christian. And then I would say, once you're there a while, you'll realize how much you needed us too. But it is easy to see outside. You know, I, I'm listening to a podcast. I, I get my, I get my devotions. I do my devotions, whatever. And I don't need the local church. There's no way to do those one another verses without it. How are you going to serve one another? How are you going to love one another? And then the second thing I would say is scripture tells us, I believe it's in Ecclesiastes that iron sharpens iron. And we often use that verse like a negative way, like, well, he rubs me the wrong way, but, you know, it's making me sharper. But I think there's a very positive thing about that. When two pieces of metal rub against each other, they both become sharper and they both become more useful. It probably moves them into the use of some kind of a tool. That's why we sharpened them. Now they become a knife or a saw blade or something like that. But if we sit and, and don't ever touch other believers, don't get a hug here and a correction here and an encouraging word here, then we become dull like that saw blade that never got sharpened. And that makes us less useless. I mean, yes, less useful. It makes us useless. We sit around then and we say, oh, I, I have my devotions. I listen to a podcast. I listen to a Mevo. I listen to a sermon every week. And we get full of head knowledge, but we aren't doing anything with it. That's very good. Another thing is, um, I know you've noticed, you've noticed this from talking to you, that um, our current culture right now, it's so against God and yes. so against everything of biblical principles. And it's so hard for Christians to stand firm alone. Yes. How do you think the local church can help you, can sharpen you, as you talked about iron sharpens iron, yeah. to, to live a life worthy of your calling, as it says in Ephesians 4, to stand firm for your faith. Yeah, that is really a, um, an issue that is so oh, worrisome right now, because even as we train kids and we send them out to college, so many then lose their faith because the culture is telling them, no, that's all wrong. Uh, and, and there I, as another place, I believe if a young person goes out into the workforce in another community or or goes to college in another community, they are going to need a local church. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is, and here is another scripture that we often um, use maybe in marriage situations, that a threefold cord is not easily broken. Yes, we can use that for a husband and a wife, and the third party, of course, is God. But I think we can use it with other believers as well. As we stand with other believers and often in the local church, and as we stand with God as the third party, we will not be as susceptible to these wrong teachings. We can help one another to see, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. Um, and, and, you know, those kinds of times when we're, we're challenged perhaps about our faith, they, we might call them pressure points. Well, if you put pressure on a point of a single rope, there's a good chance it's going to snap. But if you put pressure on a threefold cord that is braided together, put pressure on a point, it would be very difficult to break it. So I'm just all about us needing one another standing together with God. That's really good. That's really when you think about the three, I'm like thinking about that in my, my mind while you're talking the three full cord standing with the local church and combining that that is such a really good point. Yeah. 
And, you know, one of so many of the people today who are falling into progressive Christianity, that's something that Jamie and I have been just speaking out against for, it seems like months now, maybe even years. So much of that, of what they have fallen for and the lies is because they are leaving the local church. Yes, exactly. And to some point, it's because they say, well, I've been hurt by the church. And so they leave and then they get off on these tangents and they let their hurt form their theology. But yeah. what would you say to someone who has experienced pain inside the local church? Because you grew up in the church, you've lived in the church, it exists. I mean, yeah. I experienced church pain. Everybody who's ever been part of the church has experienced it because we're just, we're not perfect. We're people. And yeah, anytime absolutely. you're going to be around people, it's going to be imperfect. And it's going to happen. So what do you say to someone who's like, I don't want to be part of the local church because of the pain I've experienced, or I'm rearranging my theology and kind of maybe, well, I can't think of the word that they use right now, but maybe I'm like starting to tear my theology apart because it doesn't fit with the pain that I experienced. Well, first of all, although I, I emphasize the need for one another. The reason we go to church is not about one another to start with. It's to worship God. Right. So we can't just say, well, it wasn't comfortable for me there. So-and-so hurt my feelings and then cut out God. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to church to worship God. While we're there, we're going to be in contact with imperfect people. Some of them are going to hurt our feelings. Some of them are going to crush us sometimes. And I've been there. You've been there. But you know what? I go to the dentist and it hurts. But sometimes I come back from the dentist and I'm really glad I went because that pain was well worth it. If we let pain do its work in us, just like the Bible teaches us about pruning does its work so that the next day or the next season, the next year, we bloom and we get past the pain of the pruning. Then, you know, the, the world tells us, and I do believe this, this statement, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And our, our, our faith needs to grow. We don't go to church just to maintain. We go to church to grow. Sometimes that happens through pain. But don't give it up because the initial reason we're there is to worship God. So we got to get past ourselves. Mm -hmm. I agree. Sometimes you just have to move on. Other times, I think if it's really bad, try a different church. You know, try a different church or, you know, God gives us uh, instructions how to handle this. If you've been offended by a brother, go to that brother. Not mm -hmm. not everybody around him and gossip about that brother. Right. Go to the brother himself and talk it out. And at least, you know, sometimes sometimes that doesn't help because the brother isn't willing to hear it. But at least you did what the scripture said. And then trust God, you know, if he's trying to move you on to another church, that's great. But don't give up church altogether. Exactly. Don't just throw, you don't just, if I get a bag of potatoes and one is bad, I don't throw the whole potato away. I throw that's away right. Potato that's right. And that's I right. keep eating potatoes for the rest of my life. So you betcha, you betcha. Yeah. So what would you say to the person who just basically says, I don't need the local church in my life? How do you encourage them to just give it a try? Uh, again, I just say, if you don't, then focus on that. We need you come to the local church and try come to the local church and see where you could make uh, a difference. Um, and, and then be open to the idea that I don't know it all. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that singleness, that um, independent spirit is what often leads us into heresy. Once we are deciding we know it all and don't need anything else, and I can just uh, take the scriptures in cafeteria style, I, I'll put this and I'll pick that. That's what leads us to heresy um, and a lot of the wrong teaching that you've already talked about, the progressive thinking, a lot of that. Again, it's not about us. Right. It's, it's following God's commands. He said, do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together. Mm 
He didn't say, unless you get hurt or unless you don't really, you know, have fun there or unless you don't like the music. He didn't say that. He said, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. And then he added, and even more so as we see the day of his coming approaching, I believe Jesus is coming again. I don't know when, I don't think we're supposed to know when, but I believe he's coming again and we need to live like that every day. And part of that is being part of the local body. Yes. Amen. That'll preach. (laughs) So, okay, as we wrap up today, I have two questions for you. First of all, where can we get your book? It's on Amazon. Uh, This is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, I I would like to just describe it a little bit for people who might be interested. Sure. Each each chapter has three parts. Um, Every chapter is based on an aspect of the church, such as worship or Christian education or Um, you know, every aspect of the church, well, I shouldn't say every, but there's 11 aspects of the church mentioned. Mm -hmm. And each chapter then begins with a scenario that features that aspect of the church. It's a fictional scenario, but it gives you an idea of uh, what churches are dealing with, with that particular area. And then the second part of the chapter gives you tips on dealing with that area in the church, how to handle that area, how to grow that area. Then the third part, which is my favorite part, I had asked a certain person for each chapter who was um, raised in a small church, but is now having a worldwide impact for God to write me a little essay about their area of ministry. So for instance, Joanne Butrin was raised in the little church of Berwick, Pennsylvania. And Joanne is now over Compassion Ministries for the entire world, uh, for the Assemblies of God. Uh, So she wrote me a section on Compassion Ministries and how to reach out to help needy people, things like that. That's one section of the book. Each chapter is like that. And I think you will love, everybody that would read it would love hearing what each of those people has to say um, from Bernie Elliott, uh, who... He was, uh, you know, just got saved and was in a small, very small group of about three, four couples and became national leader of Bible quiz. Um, Small church pastors often feel like, well, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm not having an impact in the world. It's just this small area. That's so not true. Every one of us has an impact. And even if it changes a family, it'll change that family for generations, perhaps the next generation, then we'll all maybe be serving the Lord where only two were in this particular generation. And so every everybody can have an impact, including a small church and the members of that small church. So you can find it on Amazon. Okay. And there's a print book and a Kindle book, right? That's correct. I thought we did them both. Yeah. So- Go to Amazon. Um, The information is written down below and check out Holly's book. And as we wrap up today, I just want to ask you for, I like to call this your soapbox moment. (laughs) Okay. So this is one last thing that is on your heart that you just want to share with the ladies. Well, as you said, the church is not perfect. And that's, I think maybe if we go into the church knowing it's not perfect, that would alleviate a lot of the uh, stress that we think, oh man, this is the perfect church. We hear people come in and say, oh, this is perfect. I want to be here forever. They're usually the people that don't stay too long. I think it's good to recognize we're just people trying to serve the Lord and we try to do it uh, to the best of our ability, but we fail at times. We need to give each other grace in the church, but through the church, I can tell you personally, it has given uh, other adult voices to my children to confirm what we've taught them at home through their Sunday school teachers, through youth leaders. It has uh, taught our kids, as I said, how to serve. It has taught me how to serve better and to get over myself. It's also provided a safe, healthy social life 
You know, that's where we go. We go for picnics. We go to see a movie. We go to just be together. We visit in one another's households. We lift one another up in prayer. It gives us a healthy social life. Um, and on rare occasions, when we've had a crisis, you know, usually you think the pastor, he's ministering to other people. The church has ministered to us. I've been through three miscarriages. I've had breast cancer. The church has ministered to us through meals, through prayers, through encouragement, through cards, for just a listening ear. The people of the church have been there. It has helped us to fulfill the Great Commission. None of us can go on the mission field, perhaps. Uh, it, maybe our call is more to be at home, but we can fulfill the Great Commission by giving and praying. And we have like 40 missionaries on our wall that people have given toward and prayed for on a daily and weekly and monthly, yearly basis. And it's given us a central goal, a life purpose to use the church. You know, Jesus said, go into all the world. That would be the missions part. But the second part is make disciples. And so it's given us a place where we can make disciples. We have classes to teach them and small groups to teach them. So it's also given us a grounded, consistent study of God's word. You know, you can jump from app to app or devotional to devotional. But if you stay in a place of study and, and fellowship for a, a long period of time, you will get a well-rounded, consistent view of the word of God, not pulling out certain verses and taking them out of context. I, I think that Jesus said he's building his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. There nothing successful is going to stand against it. I like being on the winning side. I'm for the local church. That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today and just chatting and sharing your heart. I hope that if you listen to Holly, you will be encouraged to just get more involved in your local church. If you're not already, find a local church, get involved, give it a try. What do you have to lose? But you Amen. have so much to gain. Amen. So, Thank you, Edissa. Well, it's been so nice chatting with you. I always like when we just get to hang out and chat. Amen. Um, you're such a friend. And um, I just, I like hanging out with you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to say thank you to everyone who's taken time to listen. I know that it takes time to listen to a podcast. It takes time to watch this video. So thank you for listening with open ears and open heart. I also want to ask that if you like what you heard today, would you mind sharing it on social media, um, share it on Facebook, share it on your Instagram account so that other people can hear what Holly has to say. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a five-star rating and leave a review wherever you get your podcast. It again, helps more people to hear this podcast. If you want to learn more about our ministry, you can visit adessaholden.com. You can learn about our books or resources or like the Adessa Holden Ministries Facebook page or YouTube channel. So that's all we have for today. It's been awesome hanging out with you, Holly, and we will see all of you next time on Girl That'll Preach. The God of the universe has a plan for your life. From the beginning of time, he's had a plan to advance his kingdom, and that plan includes a role for you. Today, he is calling your name and saying, do you want to play the part I have for you? Just like the original disciples who went from being fishermen from the small town in Galilee to being world changers, God has a plan for your life that is above and beyond anything you can imagine. He has a destiny he wants you to fulfill, a life that is so much richer and more meaningful than you could even dream. Now the choice rests with you. Do you want to walk in God's call for your life? Do you want to find God's perfect will, your destiny, the reason you were created and the job he has for you? 
As you discover your calling, are you willing to do whatever it takes to walk in it? If you are ready to say yes, then it's time to read Whatever It Takes and learn how to live a life worthy of your calling. Get your copy today at Amazon or on odessaholden.com slash whatever it takes.